And greetings. Welcome to the Evidence and Reasons for the Christian Faith video channel. Today is going to be an interesting session. We're going to talk <clears throat> physics. Here we explore evidence for the Christian faith because God has hidden lots of evidence. It says in Proverbs 25 2 that it's the glory of God to conceal a matter. It's the glory of kings to search it out. The Christian faith would be easily believed by all if God had chosen to make his existence as evident as the air we breathe. But he's chosen not to do that. Uh, that starts even with the uh, even with the New Testament where Jesus just revealed himself to the apostles, then to 500, then to Paul. He could have easily just appeared to everyone. He chose not to do that. And it says the kingdom of heaven is like head, is like treasure hidden in a field. And so here we explore things like archaeology, but my specialty is science. Now, some um, unexpected things happen today. I, I've been in uh, the developments over the last two months have really sparked my interest in things in physics. I've been writing letters to physicists all over the world. Uh, one of them I'll mention here, and uh, also uh, varieties of professor, professors and other specialties. Just before I got on air, I had an hour long, con hour and a half long conversation with a researcher that uh, is interested in hiring me as a PhD student, and he said, "I want you here by September." And <laughs> just like, well, I don't think so, but um, just to show that. The things I discuss here are of extreme interest to me at a personal and professional level, even outside of you know, my theological views about young earth creationism. I find physics very fascinating. Most people know me for my biology, but that was kind of my day job. And I owe Dr. Sanford enormously for giving me an opportunity to work from home while I cared for my elderly and disabled mother who passed away last year about this time. In April 30th, went home to be with the Lord. Praise God for that. Before I go forward, uh, there's some needs that have been communicated to me personally. And I'm going to say a quick prayer. One of them is Schnoyle. He's a regular here. His uncle is gravely ill. So let me just offer this prayer. Heavenly Father, I offer, I offer this live stream to your glory. Give me wisdom in what I need to say. If I say something wrong, Lord, uh, erase it from my viewers' consciousness and help me to find the right way and to be corrected. And Lord, if I'm right, then let this idea propagate. And and Lord Jesus, I lift up Schnoyle, whose uncle is gravely ill and he may not know you. He asked me specifically to appeal to you. And Lord, also now that I'm considering now a sixth science degree, and it's going to be a lot of work, um, I ask for wisdom. And I thank you for everyone here and my friends. In Jesus' name, amen. So greetings, Dapper Dino, Beethoven, and you might be the only two viewers watching this, so I'm honored, sir. I'm going to introduce the topic in a little bit, but Jason Lyle is claiming that we can't measure the one-way speed of light. I would, and I had thought that was bad, and I've talked, I talked to a physicist by the name of Philip W. Dennis. He is an interesting character in that, like John Gideon Hartnett, he's an accomplished secular scientist. Philip Dennis has done work for NASA in general relativity, oh, by the way, we're in the middle of a rainstorm. <laughs> if lightning hits and wipes out the power, uh, this stream might have an abrupt ending. So just a heads up. Oh, wow, I got invited, Kent, with Bent. Yes, I'd be honored, Kent, with Bent. And um, Philip Dennis also has published in the Physical Review Letters, which is the top-tier physics journal in the world. 
and it was re regarding general relativity. So, so th there's someone who's a young earth creationist published in the secular world. He has several publications in his specialty. He obviously has worked with top tier people in that specialty in physics. And he's been critical of other young earth creationists. And I appreciate his boldness to come out. So he alerted me to this experiment of the femtosecond camera. It can actually, so when you have a laser pulse, you have the, you know, when you strike up a laser, that beam has, uh, that beam has kind of a, like the front of the train, you know, like uh, the engine of the train. It's the, it's the front. It's like the point of the spear. And you could see it traveling through a refractive medium. And I'm just going to show slides of it. I linked to the I linked to this in the video description, uh, the slow slow mo guys video. There's some copyright issues. I could actually show it if this were a recorded show. They would just get revenue at, sent to them. But when you when you do copyrighted material in a live stream, YouTube will sometimes shut you down in the middle of the stream. So it's perfectly legal. It's just kind of their internal policy. I mean, I'm happy to, to get these guys uh, revenue for their, their very fine work by airing it on my channel. I just can't do it in a live stream. So in lieu of that, I took some screen captures of this experiment. And let me just show it to you. Wrong one. Hang on. So let me let me shrink my. I, I would be so unlucky as to to have highlighted the wrong thing, but let's see if I could get this going. All right. So that's screen capture one. I had this all queued up, but I'm such a klutz when it comes to using Streamlabs. So I have I have kind of a new platform here. So let me try to describe what you're about to see, and you could watch this. So we have this wave train coming here. This is the point of the laser beam right there, the laser pulse. This thing can capture things at femtosecond resolution. It's just like, uh, what was it, 10 million? Uh, 10 bazillion frames per second. So I'm just going to now just plow through this. So at four, so let, let, let's say at, uh, I don't know why I got that funny look now. Now I'm a little upset. I just destroyed my window. Let me try to go back. Guys, I I profuse apologies here. I don't know what's going on. It mean okay, I think I know what's going on. Let's I'm gonna try to let me try to redo this, guys. <clears throat> Go back to window one. Oh man! All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna go to a screen capture mode. One one moment. This is this is really obnoxious. Okay, doing a little better now. So let me just uh, go through this this image here and see if I could get this kind of going the way where I want it to go. All right. And I want to get more of that image there. Let me shrink it so you could see it better. Okay, that's what thousands, millions, billions, trillions of frames per second. 
or whatever that number is. I just call it 10 bazillion. So you could see the 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 edge of the of this wave train here. So th in this case it's going through a vial of milk. A vial of milk. So you could see it at 15, 20. All right, this is definitely measuring the one-way speed of light. So Dr. Dennis showed this to me. I, I have, I think, some of my slides out of sync here. Let me get, let me get slide 35. It's in the wrong spot. Let me move it. Okay, see if I could get it in the right spot now. 15 seconds. 15 picoseconds, about 20 picoseconds. I still got the wrong one there. Apologies. Let's see if I could get them ordered. 25, 20. How did I get 20 in the wrong spot? That's what happens when I'm not prepared. OK, 15, 20. 25, 35. They're supposed to be 130. I ended up getting some duplicates here. Ah, it's aggravating. I thought I had it nicely sequenced. This one needs to go way back. Let's try it again, guys. 15, 20. 25, 30, 35, 40. So you could see then if the if the wave train is going the opposite way and if it were faster, you, you would be able to detect the one-way speed of light with this experiment. And there are any number of ways to implement this to, to kind of make it more refined. But Dr. Dennis pointed this out, and I was like, yeah, yeah, I agree. And there any number of other ways to conceptualize this, but this was the easiest to visualize. How can you say, how can you look at this and say you can't measure the one-way speed of light? There's situations you can't. So um, it depends on your apparatus. So what I'm what I'm willing to say is that under certain circumstances you won't be able to, but under other circumstances where you could synchronize the clocks, you can. And this is going to be an issue of synchronizing the clocks. But this is kind of a simple way of like saying, OK, this is close enough to synchronize the clock. Because you're using the same clock to measure it going this way, and the same clock measuring it to go the other way. You could fire off the lasers at about the same time, and then you could see them intersect each other, you could see which one is going faster with an experiment like this. So again, I put it in the video description. You could see how they're doing this. And this, um, oh, oh, oh yeah, you can You can synchronize the clocks. That's what Dapper Dino is objecting to. I'm going to cite the Heifel-Keating experiment. You are able to synchronize the clocks. If you move them together very slow so that there's no time dilation, you can move them back apart, slow speed, move them back together, and compare the clocks. You'll be able to determine if they experienced any time dilation. That's going to be significant. Then you know the clocks are synchronized. But the point is, with this experiment, the clock you don't have a clock synchronization problem. You only have one clock. You have it right here, this this clock. You can see the clock right there. And this will lead to absurdities uh, that Dr. Dennis and I might be able to see. There's no clock synchronization problem. You only have one clock. And we may write up some essays where we cite that this leads to absurdities, like the velocity of the electron. Um, if you have one-way speed of light and the electron's going in the direction of that, the faster speed of light, 
versus the electron going in the opposite direction, you will get different um, you'll get different Lorentz factors and one electron will be heavier than the other depending on the direction then that will also lead to absurdities. So um, so anyway what Dr. Dennis has said is that um, are, are we talking about physical things or uh, kind of conceptual coordinates? So this is the best that I could provide you and um, th this is the simplest so take it or leave it and I'm gonna just offer this up for discussion but uh, the, the speed of light in one direction would affect the velocity of the electron uh, also when you're trying to when, when you're trying to get it to move uh, by accelerating it with a potential difference it's going to be moving faster in one direction than the other. Now, if you can't, if, if you're going to argue that we can't measure the speed of a of a charged particle like the electron, you know how long it takes to go from point A to B, and we're just using the same clock like we do here. So I, let me just throw this out there. If you don't like the light, we have one clock. We can estimate the position of the electron with that one clock going left to right. And if there's a one-way speed of light, one electron uh, going in one direction is going to be faster than another electron going the other. So, and, and what Mr. Jetty points out, he said, this could theoretically work in a universe made only of photons, or what they call a Milne universe, which has nothing in it. But in a non-Milne universe, like where we are, where we can have things like cesium beam atomic clocks, this is where I think uh, it fails. So I think the way, the fair way to say this is that there would be situations you can't measure the one-way speed of light. And then there are situations where you would be able to. I'm going to cite the FISU experiment. And I'm embarrassed to say that I never learned about the FISU experiment until after I'd studied relativity. But this is an interesting experiment where you can actually have variable speed of light if you're using refractive mediums. So, so in vacuum speed of light, uh, a lot of what you learned in relativity, you're dealing in the, in the, in the vacuum arena. It's different when you have refractive media. And I'm going to try to explain this as best as I can here. So this is the FISU experiment. And what you have to do is take into account the refractive index of the material and then its velocity relative to your rest frame uh, equipment. So here we have water traveling like this. Let me try to make this a little larger. And this led to some very interesting developments in physics. So yeah, this is a physio experiment. And I think the thing that's amazing, this was, when was this done? That was the apparatus. And this is 1851. I mean, OK, guys, he didn't have sophisticated electronics like we have now did not have sophisticated, he didn't have the cesium beam or these uh, sapphire controlled clocks like Jan, John Hartnett. He had to do this with interferometry. So water is a refractive medium and he is pumping water at a certain velocity. What he noticed was if you have this sunlight coming in here and you have the water moving, you'd have the registered, the time between um, the sunlight hitting here and then hitting there implies that the velocity increases as you speed up the water. Now this doesn't happen in a vacuum. I got to emphasize that. This is why it's so screwy because when you do relativity in vacuums, 
uh, it starts to be different when you deal with refractive media. Refractive media. And, and Dapper's Dino is asking some pointed questions here, and you know, just in all honesty, I'm not I'm not equipped to kind of go into all of this, and part of it is I have to relearn some of this. So I, it's it's I will freely admit I'm appealing to Dr. Dennis's work. And he's probably the, you know, among the young earth creationists, he probably knows relativity better than any young earth creationist at this point. So I would not have been so um, so forthright if he didn't back me on this because he, you know, um, there there's kind of these private forums where we discuss things. And I said, I, I don't think. Dr. Lyle is correct. I think we can measure one-way speed of light in our universe, which is a non-Milne universe. And he said, you're absolutely right. So um, notwithstanding your questions, Dapper, I, I, I don't have um, a good answer for you right now. So wait, so isn't um, interferometry, it's like going to need clock synchronization? No. Interferometry does not need clocks. That's why, that's my, okay, that's my provisional answer. Someone can help me with that. But the thing with interferometry, okay, look at the apparatus here. He didn't have any clocks to be able to measure delays. So if you think about it, how could he possibly measure changes in the speed of light without clocks? He used interferometry. And so this was the interferometry experiment here. So when he accelerated, when he sped up, when he accelerated the speed of the water here, he could get the speed of light to go faster. Again, this doesn't happen in a vacuum, but with a refractive media, this is what's so cool about the experiment. So in a refractive media, the speed of light is slower than what it is in a vacuum. And, and, and so therefore, uh, you're not going to exceed the speed of light in a vacuum when it's going through a refractive media, like water. But what you can do is as you move the water faster and faster and faster, it starts to approach the value of the speed of light in the vacuum. So, so therefore, you're able to measure the one-way speed of light. Uh, and what I mean by that is the speed of light is slower in this direction and it's higher in this direction in a refractive media. So with an interferometer, we can definitely do this with, we can definitely do this with, with refractive media. I would, I would argue by way of extension, we could do it in a vacuum media. And I think that's what the Michelson-Morley experiment was attempting to do. And I'm gonna, I have kind of a, a variant of that uh, and this leads to some interesting questions, whether there's a one-way speed of light in vacuum. I'd say I think there's a possibility it's small, and we'll go into that later because I'm going to show you the interferometer I built. So I I'm just throwing this out there, but again, I would, I would point you all to the, to, to the, uh, let's see if I can get this going again. Is it window one? I point you all to the uh, to, to 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 this the slow mo guys video of how light can propagate, and you only have one clock, and you could see the light pulse travel across. So just from common sense intuition, if you had a different speed going the other way, you'd see the light pulse uh, go faster, and definitely, it would seem to me that you like experiments where you have refractive media, this is what you're going to see. That the light pulse goes slower uh, depending on the direction of your water, uh, you know, relative to the, to the beam of light. So I think that's, you know, you just extrapolate it to the vacuum. So that's about all I have to say on that. And I'm just throwing this out there. There'll be more publications hopefully essays, uh, Dr. Dennis kindly 
offered to review some of my essays on this topic as, as well as uh, special relativity. I want to write stuff on special relativity. So, oh, by the way, uh, Mr. Jetty, great to see you. Schnoyle, uh, at the opening of the show, I offered a prayer for your, for your dear uncle. And um, so I, I dedicate the show to the Lord and also to the health of your dear uncle. I also want to thank all the graduate students that have views that view that are part of my community here. Uh, we're a small community here of nerds. We don't appeal to the general public, that's for sure. And you've inspired me to <laughs> consider going back to school. So some of you who may have come late, I uh, today I had an hour and a half conversation with a professor that's interested in me uh, going to graduate school. So. Um, this is probably not, I, I think, the, the questions I've seen in the side chat and the comments are very compelling. I'm not in a position to resolve them all, and so uh, I'm for the most part deferring to uh, forthrightly because of Dr. Dennis's encouragement to me. And you could, if you want to read Dr. Dennis's, okay, this is going to be fun for Dapper Dino and Benthoven. Why don't you compare any of Dr. Dennis's articles to Kent Hovind's dissertation? I think that would be fun. Or, I mean, you're just going to see just like five orders of magnitude quantum leap of just intellectual ability. So, um, so now I'm going to go to this interferometry experiment. Now, I can't claim credit for the design of this interferometer. There's been a discussion that has claimed to be settled that keeps going back and forth. Whether the ether exists or not, the standard claim in, in my graduate physics, they said, you know, um, Michelson morally refuted the ether. But there is one thing. Most of his interferometers were vacuum. The one that had an air, di air dielectric, just like in the physio experiment. So the physio experiment had water, had a medium. In the original Michelson-Morley, they let air in there. And the air then has that effect. You can, you can have one-way speed of light measurements. It, it turned out uh, if you use that quote unquote Fresnel drag term, you know, the Fresnel drag is <sighs> this is getting complicated relativity. There's what they call the velocity addition theorem in special relativity. They can explain that thing with the, the moving water adding velocity to the speed of light. It's called the velocity addition theorem. You can look it up. The first couple of terms in that series expansion of the velocity addition theorem is what they would call Fresnel drag. The Fresnel drag is kind of the ether version of that theory. Now if you can either use the velocity addition term or the Fresnel drag. You know, let's use the Fresnel drag approximation. When you do that, you'll see that you're actually getting Fresnel drag inside the Michelson Morley experiments that had a refracted media, that is, namely the air. Dayton Miller had the same thing and he was not able to quite eliminate that. And some people picked up on that and started building interferometers, Michelson-Morley interferometers with refracted media, and they were claiming to get to detect absolute motion. Um, there is reason that I accept absolute motion. It's the Heffel-Keating experiment. So let me cover the Heffel-Keating experiment because it has some interesting numbers. And I just want you to think about this, whether there's an absolute rest frame. The reason for that is you have the absolute. I mean, one reason you think that is the electron has an absolute rest mass. That means there's a point where the, uh, you know, uh, the electron is presumed to be standing still. It means to be at rest. Rest in relation to what? And so let's let's just cover the Heffel-Keating experiment, and then we'll go into the interferometry. 
because these these are related. So um, I'm just going to read some of this, the Hefel Keating experiment. Um, actually, let me let me just grab the let's see if I can. Might be better if I just grab the. The experiment. Then I can uh, f from Wikipedia. This is really kind of funny. Let's see if I could put it out here. And thank you for your forbearance. Uh, these are not the most polished presentations. Uh, event. Uh, this is more like the editing room floor. What I do here. So the Hefel Keating experiment uh, was a test of the theory of relativity. In October 1971, Joseph C. Hefel, a physicist, and Richard E. Keating, an astronomer, took four cesium beam atomic clocks aboard commercial airliners. They flew twice around the world, first eastward, then westward, and compared the clocks against each other that remained at the United States Naval Observatory. When reunited, these three sets of clock were found to disagree with one another. So they were reunited, okay? And their differences were uh, consistent with the predictions of special and general relativity. Uh, I, I just, if I may take a, a cute detour here. Um, Hafel, an assistant professor at Washington University in St. Louis, was preparing notes for a physics lecture when he did a back-of-the-envelope calculation showing that an, atomic, that an atomic clock aboard a commercial airliner should have sufficient precision to detect the predicted relativistic effects. He spent a year of in fruitless attempts to get funding for such an experiment until he was approached after a talk on the topic by Keating, an astronomer at the United States Naval Observatory who worked with atomic clocks. Hafel and Keating obtained $8,000 in funding from the Office of Naval Research for one of the most inexpensive tests ever conducted of general relativity. Of this amount, $7,600 was spent on the eight round the world plane tickets, including two seats on each flight for Mr. Clock, quote unquote. They flew eastward around the world, ran the clock side by side for a week, and then flew westward. The crew of each flight helped by supplying the navigational data needed for the comparison with theory, in addition to the scientific papers published in science. There were several accounts published in the popular press and other publications. So this is an interesting experiment, and you saw the picture there, them beside Mr. Clock, and there's the cute little stewardess, or flight attendant. And so I'm just going to read this. According to special relativity, the rate of a clock is greatest according to an observer who is at rest res with respect to the clock. In a frame of reference in which the clock is not at rest, the clock runs more slowly, as expressed by the Lorentz factor. This effect, called time dilation, has been confirmed in many tests of special relativity, such as the ives stillwell experiment and others. Considering the Hafel Keating experiment in a frame of reference at rest with respect to the center of the Earth, because this is an inertial frame, a clock aboard the plane moving eastward in the direction of the Earth's rotation had a greater velocity, resulting in a relative time loss, than one that remained on the ground, while the clock aboard the plane moving westward, according to the Earth's rotation, had a lower velocity than one on the ground. General relativity predicts an additional effect, in which an increase in gravitational potential due to altitude speeds the clocks up. That is, the clocks at higher altitude tick faster than clocks on Earth's surface. This effect has been confirmed by in many tests of general re relativity, such as the Pound-Rebka experiment and gravity probe A. In the Hafiel keating experiment, there is a slight increase in gravitational potential due to altitude that tended to speed the clocks back up. The, the aircraft flew at roughly the same altitude in both directions, this effect was approximately the same for the two planes, but nevertheless it caused a difference in comparison 
to the clocks on the ground. So remember, they're, I, I'm presuming they're flying in a basically around the Earth. So you're able to get back to the naval research, the, the, the naval uh, research absorb the naval observatory, uh, without having to backtrack. You just keep flying in the same direction, and so then you could bring the you can bring all the clocks um, together, and so according to special relativity, the clock flying eastward would actually lose time, and that's the number of seconds, and the clock flying westward would gain time. And then they had to add the corrections with gravitational, the, the general relativity, and, and, and so they had predicted results here. I, I'll, I'll point out, you, you notice it's not um, symmetric. And it was it was well it, it was within reasonable experimental error. Now this suggests I mean, I'm just pointing out here. So so definitely, if you go one direction, your clock's going to speed up. If you go another direction, your clock's going to slow down. That suggests there's a point when you're you can consider yourself quote unquote at rest. That's why I call it like a kind of a rest frame. And I think there. If we're out in space and you don't have any references, I think you can actually determine the rest frame using methods of the half fail Keating. You just keep going in various directions, and and then you're able, you know, you can compare it against. Uh, hopefully, you'll be able to get to a a, a clock that, that's, you know, you can reference. You, you should be able to find out whether um, you're in that rest frame. Uh, and, and this is what I need to, to, to review with Dr. Dennis, uh, because definitely when you're accelerating versus something that had never accelerated in its history, you're definitely at a faster relative velocity. And you will, uh, you know, do you apply the time dilation one way or the other? You know, which one is supposed to be your reference? And you'll actually be able to tell which one is supposed to be your reference. Uh, based on the clocks, for one, and that'll tell you which guy has been accelerating over time. So there is a difference. It's not all relative. That's my theory, and that's what I need to run by Dr. Dennis. So I do believe that there's an absolute rest frame, and that's backed up by quantum mechanics that says it's desirable, desirable to have an absolute clock. It's desirable to have an absolute clock. Quantum mechanics likes that. And Sabina Hassenfelder, it said, General relativity is not quite right, and she specifically cited the fact that in quantum mechanics you want an absolute clock, uh, and general relativity resists that. One way to resolve it then is it's not that time is dilated, your clocks have slowed down. Your clocks have slowed down. To me, that's kind of a more uh, elegant explanation that time didn't really change. The, the velocity does something to your measuring device. To me, that's just, you know, personally more elegant, and it would also reconcile with quantum mechanics. And the nice thing then is you don't, you still will be able to retain most, if not all, the equations of special relativity and still invoke absolute clocks. So that, that's subject of a future discussion. All right, so you definitely can feel acceleration. Oh my goodness, you can. And so if you have like kind of the twin paradox situation, one twin knows he's been accelerating and the other twin knows that he hasn't. So in that sense, the twin who wasn't accelerating, you could say he, he, was, he was in a rest frame. Now, given what you saw with the Hafel Keating experiment, it depends. There's one qualification. Because you saw that the clocks either gain time or lost time depending on the direction. That suggests to me that they're, you know, this is relative. They already had some inherent velocity, which they did because of the Earth's rotation. So, yes, I'm a clock, uh, I'm a clock absolutist. And, and, and quantum mechanics would suggest that. And 
Sabina Hassenfelder, uh, the back reaction channel, um, covered that. And I, you know, at one time I thought what I was saying is heretical, but this is starting to pop up now while they're trying to get this thing called quantum gravity. So with that, um, let me now try to describe the interferometer I'm building. And I got inconclusive results. And it's using this whole thing like the physio experiment where we're trying to do kind of like what Michelson Morley did, but instead of using vacuum between in the interferometer, we're using a refractive media. We might actually be able to detect absolute motion. So if we assume an absolute clock, it kind of lends credence to the idea of absolute motion. So uh, do I have the paper here? <sighs> Bummer. Let me bring it up. I have to bring up the paper. It's on my, it's on my computer, and it has pictures of the interferometer the Cahill built. And I've been in touch with Dr. Cahill in, in Flinders University. He's an emeritus professor at Flinders. And um, unlike people that have criticized Einstein, it's like this guy, I could tell he knew what he was talking about. So let's see. I call it the cheap interferometer. And, and Cahill has done a lot of work also with looking, looking at the um, interferometer of Michelson that had air as a medium and also as air as a medium and then also other interferometers throughout history and then also an experiment at Belgicon and I might cover that. So let me see, okay. So this is a picture of the that interferometer. Again, it's it's, it's very similar. It has some it, it it has some elements that are similar to the physio experiment where we're trying to build the interferometer with a refract refractive component rather than a pure vacuum. And he claims he's been able to get the the uh, detection of absolute motion that Michelson and Morley were attempting to find. And he also claims that the original the original Michelson-Morley interferometer that had uh, air in it, when you add the refractive component like you would with the physio experiment, but using air instead of water, you actually see the effect and you can detect absolute motion. So there's been a series of attempts to make Michelson-Morley interferometers that use refractive media. So uh, I'm going to just show pictures of this interferometer. And I call it, it's, uh, uh, so I can't take credit for the design of this interferometer. I, 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 I just tried to re rebuild it. And it's not that complicated. Um, it took me about a week to try to understand enough to construct it. So I put a link in the video description if people want to look at the construction of this. And he was very good at giving a parts list. This is very nice. This is a beautiful scientific paper in as much as he had enough details to, uh, including the names of the vendors, God bless him, where to get the equipment, like, like Thor Labs, thankfully now, he lives in Australia. I live near D.C., and I'm not too far from New Jersey where Thor Labs is based. And he would, he would describe the, every component. So I, I, I want to salute him for that. So I'll show you some pictures of the interferometer. That's the schematic. And so what you see there are, if they may look like wires, those are uh, they are wires, but they're optical wires. And you could see the like the position of the uh, the laser there. You have a laser. You have a, a, a photodiode. So Ben Rex, if you're listening, I'm sure you'd enjoy that. This is electrical engineering and photonics. And then you have a machine that records the the data. And so the light is traveling through here, and it it does some interferometry uh, because you actually have two you have two you basically have 
um, two beams traveling in opposite directions. And you'll make um, the interference pattern, as that interference pattern changes, you might be detecting uh, your motion relative to, to, to space. And the, the, it, re it relates to the orbit of the sun. So I'm, if I'm not explaining that well, it's in the paper, OK? And I link to it. So, so Nate Lawrence had asked, he'd like to see my interferometer. So let me show you how he implemented it and all the connections. And he describes this in painful detail, thankfully, because I was able to reconstruct it. So that's the interferometer parts there. You could see the optical cables here and the connectors. And so let me see if I can dig this out. So my version, I don't know if you could see it here. Oh boy. Let me uh, see if I could kill my zoom screen here. So now, now my background won't look so nice because I'm going to kill the, the, uh, the green screen effect. Give me a moment. And I'm going to choose a virtual background that's none just so it, it, it doesn't blink. Now this isn't going to look so good anymore. Bummer. So, but in the interest of science rather than aesthetics, I'm going to select none. All right. So, so you can see here, this is my, to give you an idea of the size. So you could see the size of the connectors there. And this is like the photodiode detector. And then I would connect the, I have connectors there. And this is a Thor Labs laser. I have to confess, this laser's probably have to cost my car <laughs> in this little box. Um, oh yeah, Benrex, greetings, brother. So I'm doing some photonics and interferometry. This is this is a photonics. This is from a photonics lab. This Thor Labs thing. And, and so here, out comes here's where the laser beam comes out. And. Um, I have to figure a way to, to attenuate the, the strength of this signal. So, Nate Lawrence, if you're disappointed, I don't blame you. There's really not much to this. But, it, oh, Ben Rick says, I will build lasers more expensive than your box. <laughs> okay, so now let's go back to the... Um, Let's go back to the, see if I could find it now. Uh, yeah, here we go. One second. So, so you could see this is how he, you know, he has a nicer setup, and you. I was just trying to give you a relative size of the connectors. When you see, saw this, when I first saw this, I thought these these little these little uh, spools here were gigantic. They're they're teeny tiny, and this made it hard to construct this interferometer. And he goes into the theory. There you could. There are terms of. Um, boy. He's, let me just try to explain a little bit for general relativity here. For the uninitiated, can I move this thing? Nah. For the uninitiated, these may look like powers and subscripts. They're actually indicating the sort of tensors that are involved. 
um, the kind of transformation. It's not powers. So that's where it's a little confusing. Like when you see the superscript with C superscript two, that's C squared. But in here, these these are these are part of the tensor notations. And I have to go back honestly to try try to re view this. And Schnoyle said, the, to be honest, the original one looks better. Oh, absolutely. So I, I'd, I'd really like to build one that's more like the original. The original, and then what they had to do is they had to put, let me try to explain what happens. So you put this inside a plastic bag, and I'll show you that. Let's see. Do they have it? You put it inside a plastic bag. Sorry, it's jumping around here. This is slow. You put it inside a plastic bag, and then you put the plastic bag inside a, a container, a bucket like that. And then you put the bucket inside a water bath like that. And then you connect computers and all sorts of things. So, so what's the purpose of doing all this? Well, the interferometer is very sensitive to temperature. And I found out the hard way. I said, Dr. Cahill, I can't get this to, to work. It won't stabilize. You know, the interferometer is just going all over the place and just a matter. He said, oh, put it in water and, and dump some ice in there. It, it got to behave better. But those, those uh, optical wires, when you squeeze them, uh, it, it, you'll get interference fringes. And I was like, bummer. So the... To improve this, I'd have to have like an isobaric chamber temperature control, and then I, I might have a chance. So I was not able to duplicate his results. Um, I will say his co-author, probably at the time, was uh, a graduate student. He's now a postdoctoral fellow. So this is Cahill and Stokes. And um, let me show you their results. And I wanted to, I was trying desperately to replicate the results. I got inconclusive because I couldn't stabilize my interferometer. So now you know that, it, you know, uh, you can build these on the cheap. But he was able to detect, uh, okay, so the photodiode that I showed you here, th this, this photodiode device, you can, it, it, it picks up the laser beam, is able to determine the interference fringes and the energy, and 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 it registers voltage throughout the day. So in a, this is a 24-hour day, and you could see that it, it's it, it's able to adjust to the diurnal motions of the Earth. So when it's you have the orbital speed plus our speed relative to the cosmic mic the microwave background radiation, which is estimated at 300 meters per second or something like that, meters or kilometers, I don't remember off the top of my head. But then that means is when the Earth rotates, it's having more speed at the uh, where the interferometer is, depending on the time of day, it's having more absolute speed. And so he's able to de detect the absolute speed um, of the Earth through space, which he claims was in the original um, Michelson-Morley interferometer that had air. Once you made it a vacuum, you could no longer get that physio-type um, phenomenon. So the, the key to this is having a dielectric. Then you can detect the absolute motion. And um, if I have explained this poorly and have, uh, you know, it's, it's not beyond me, given the complexity of this uh, topic. Let's see if I can get myself back in focus. Yeah. Um, you have the paper there that goes into the theory. So we covered, th this is one case you can measure. So, so Jason Lyle says you can't measure the one-way speed of light. So, so there are two things here. Is there a one-way speed of light? And can you measure it? This is an example, if Cahill is correct, and I'm, you know, I'm not committed one way or the other, but I'm interested, just curious. 
that one, you can measure a one-way speed of light just as you can in that physio experiment, and I showed the physio experiment. Um, you, you can measure it, and physio actually did measure the one-way speed of light. Uh, granted, this is refracted media. And secondly, can it, can it be detected in, in, can you build a detector that can measure the, uh, the motion of the Earth, where depending on the time of day, you'll get a different direction, you'll get a different um, speed of light, just because you're, uh, the Earth is rotating and you're getting different speeds of light. It, it, it's, you know, does that mean something can go faster or slower than the speed of light? You know, that really, you know, again, this is like kind of like the physio experiment. You know, below, below the vacuum speed, you could have variability in the speed of light. That was, that's been demonstrated. Uh, that doesn't get the young earth creationists what they really want, which would be um, variable speed of light that changes in a vacuum. You can do it in dielectrics, as I've shown. So uh, there, there are lots of issues here, and I just, you know, um, I'm kind of fumbling through this right now. But, you know, for some of you that um, are just interested in the issues and kind of the, the recent experiments, I hope this has been of interest to you. And um, that's about it, guys. And, I'm, I'm Nate, you know, uh, that interferometer I built isn't quite as exciting. But since I've talked about it, uh, I figured I'd put it on the table. Uh, uh, Dr. Cahill and uh, now Dr. Finn Stokes uh, ran this. They, they built two of these interferometers, put them in different buildings, uh, compared the results. That's good that they had two apparatus. They were getting the same diurnal changes, detecting absolute motion, which I think is really cool. Uh, so they claim, and I have to qualify that. And they ran the experiment for uh, several weeks. So um, you all can read it in the papers there. And I have to confess that some of the general relativity was still a little bit beyond my reach where they started to, to deal with that. And what's kind of frustrating is you have general relativity that's the Einsteinian version. They keep flipping between the Neo-Lorentzian version, and it's kind of hard to tell which one which mode they're in. So I'm going to just briefly look at the side chat here. And greetings, Wesley Coleman. Um, ben Rex says, evidence and reason, I found it interesting seeing it. And now I have another stream to rewatch, at least to the point where I entered. Yeah, um, uh, you'll like the one where they're actually able to show the speed of light as the, as the laser beam hit. They had this uh, baz 10 bazillion frames per second camera. You could see the the front of the wave train actually going through uh, uh, water. And you could actually see the, la the head of the laser beam actually marching across the screen. It was cool. Um, that was just unbelievable. So, uh, that was, I think that was the highlight of the show, and I have to give credit to Dr. Uh, Philip W. Dennis for that. So um, let me just look at uh, logical plausible probables here. Dying sun, Schnoil, Dapper Dino, Benthoven, and Bent, you know how to get a hold of me. I'd be glad to come on your show. And we've done a lot of fun things here, like with Winger crystals, uh, heavy electron quasi-particles, kind of taking down the Big Bang and radiometric dating with all this, you know, the possibility of it. Mr. Jetty, who actually works on an accelerator. This is just exciting stuff to see you guys here. Can't tell you how much of an, an encouragement you are to me. Um, I welcome well-reasoned comments in the uh, in the video uh, comment section and we're all kind of getting clumsy clumsily trying to navigate all this so with that I'll close the show with um, a poem a poem so let me get the poem queued up and that'll be it for today I'd like to 
offer this live stream uh, to the glory of God, but also in, in tribute to Schnoil's uh, uh, uncle who's needing some prayers. And then all the people have joined me live and also in the chat. So take care and the Lord richly bless you. Enjoy the poetry reading here. Slipped the surly bonds of earth and danced the skies on laughter's silvered wings. Sunward I've climbed and joined the tumbling mirth of sun split clouds and done a hundred things you have not dreamed of. Wheeled and soared and swung high in the sunlit silence. Hovering there, I've chased a shouting wind along and flung my eager craft through footless halls of air. Up. Up the long, delirious, burning blue. I've topped the windswept heights with easy grace where never lark nor even eagle flew. And while with silent Lifting mind, I've trod the high, untrespassed sanctity of space, put out my hand, and touched the face of God. <laughs>